Hello, welcome to the pod with Garrett L. Conan. And this is where I interview local entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, ranging from uh, business founders and entrepreneurs to creatives and artists to peel back the curtain on, uh, on their success and their stories so that hopefully we can extract some tools, tips, and tactics that they use to uh, become successful. And through that, I hope to inspire you, the audience, as well as uh, hopefully give you some tangible things you can apply to your personal or professional life so that you can grow and uh, live the life of your dreams. So uh, without further ado, we got uh, Jansen Eagler here for the first podcast. Welcome, Jansen. <laughs> Welcome. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, I guess a little brief intro into Jansen. Um, Jansen is a proud Texas Christian University Horn Frog. Jansen uh, dove headfirst into the alcohol business world during college, getting world-class exposure alongside experienced beverage entrepreneurs. He started as the first hire at Helmsman Imports, an alcohol importer, at the age of 22, where he moved over 3 million uh, goods in and around the United States while setting up trade routes in Italy, Mexico, Brazil, and China. Then in 2021, Jansen, along with two other partners, co-founded Drayhorse, a Philadelphia-based co-packing facility that specializes in canning and bottling. Drayhorse boasts over 30 clients worldwide that range from the number one bar in North America to celebrity brands like Sweet Chick and Juice Runners. He is also the co-founder of Choco Smooth, a new uh, milk chocolate and white chocolate liqueur. And Jansen prides himself on being the face of the operations behind the entities and brands he works on. He's got tons of war stories being in the trenches that I'm easy to, that I'm uh, eager to uncover. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good start there. Yeah, that's pretty good start. Yeah. So this uh, operations role, tell me a little bit more. What do you do for all these brands and companies? Yeah, I mean, operations in the early stages is really just, everything. I mean, it could be running legal compliance one day, getting licenses, um, actually physically being in a facility one day, producing product, you know, creating pricing strategies, managing vendor relationships, um, really just the unsung, like here, it's kind of like the lineman to the business or to the, uh, the football team, pulling a lot of weight, but a little bit behind the scenes, but uh, yeah, operation just means a lot of titles and um, day to days, there's no set day. It's just whatever pops up, whatever fire you need to put out, you're there. So Expert problem solver. <laughs> I wouldn't solutions. say expert. Uh, getting there, but yeah, problem solver, the, the professional problem solver of the organization. So, Absolutely. That makes sense. And then, uh, you know, thanks for sending over that bio and that uh, brief entrepreneur journey. <laughs> of course. That was uh, great to get into. So something actually really stood out to me. And uh, that's kind of where I want to start. It sounds like there are several instances in your early childhood where you completely latched on to an idea. What I mean by that is uh, apparently when uh, you were around 10 to 12, you're watching Shark Tank, and that's when you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that was probably the earliest memory I have of wanting to be an entrepreneur or at least somebody that was doing something out of the ordinary um, you know, the place where I grew up, it was like Midwest, very central part of Illinois. A lot of industrial giants there, a lot of like soy, corn, agriculture, businesses that do with that. So basically, when you live in that kind of place and you grow up, it's like you've got a couple career paths. You're either going to be a farmer, you're going to be somebody that works in one of those factories, or um, just kind of a day job doing something within like the local community and um uh, you know, a lot of my family does things like that. And I just kind of knew that it wasn't really for me. I wanted to get out and do things and see things. And uh, so the cornfields just were not calling my name. So, yeah, I think I was probably 12 when I saw Shark Tank and I saw people on there, like, pitching ideas and products and raising money and discussing equity. And I just think the, the idea of bringing something from your brain into your hand is really what enticed me. And uh, it just so happened that the route that I took kind of got me to a place where I can take ideas from your head into your hand. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's when I really discovered what I wanted to do and uh, the path that I kind of wanted to go down. That's awesome. Did you have any business ideas while you were growing up as a kid trying to, trying to make something? <laughs> I actually I 
did. I, now, I was never the kid that, like, started a lemonade stand or, like, I was never grinding and hustling, like, flipping baseball cards and whatnot. But uh, when I was in high school, I had a friend named JC. Shout out, shout out JC. I wasn't even going to shout him out, but him and I both wanted to be entrepreneurs. And um, we decided we were going to start a auto detailing business. Call it Zen C Enterprises. You know, little little name combination. So we started that, did a couple cars, and then we were like, you know what? Let's start a card game. I don't know who came up with the idea, but we came up with this idea to start a card game that was called Master Debaters. And there's a there's a story here. So we started this card game, and the premise was like, let's have cards where you have topics to debate, and then you have to debate them in like a funny accent. That was the original idea. So we, we started it, we prototyped it, went online, like found a place where we could print the cards, send them out. And I've got, I can document all, I've documented all of this. And, um, you know, we're like 16, 17 at the time. We had this game. It was cool. You know, play it a couple of times with your buddies, but we never took it anywhere past that. But we blasted it online, like forums, like, hey, how do we do this? You know, just stupid 16 year olds. Like, how can we make this a business? Well, about four years later, I was at a Target at TCU. I mean, the idea had, like, fallen off. I'm walking to the toy section, and I'm looking at the card games, and my jaw just drops. Master Debaters from Smosh. Exact same game, exact same name, everything to the T. So I took to Twitter. This was back when I was on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter anymore, but uh, I was like, Smosh stole our, our card game, and I called my buddy. I was like, you wouldn't believe this, and... uh that was the very first, like, business. It was the auto detailing and the uh, the card game. And then really, um, other than that, didn't start anything. No side projects, no side hustles. And then, you know, went to college and did all that jazz. Absolutely. <laughs> I guess it was a good idea if someone ran with it. You know, that, and that's what we took from it. It was like, it's really sad that we had an idea taken from us, but... We're like, and we don't know if it was like 100%. They took it from us, but it was pretty uncanny that everything was on the money the same. But uh, it just validated like who we were. It was like, okay, we have good ideas. We can do this. So, yeah, that that was the uh, that was just a funny story. And then you uh, casually met a man named Leonard at the pool on vacation. Yes. And uh, tell me about that. Yeah, that was a uh, that was kind of a. Uh, oh, a crazy experience. So we were down in Florida on vacation. It was myself, my mom, my aunt, my brother, and um, the hotel pool. It was like one of you rent a condo. It wasn't like a hotel. It was like you know you rent out somebody's timeshare, go spend the week. And uh, I was by the pool, and like there was somebody there that was bringing drinks from like a local bar. And this guy had ordered a drink and like sat next to us. And I don't know how the conversation started, but we ended up talking about just who he was, like, he, he had a timeshare there, and he was asking who we were, and um, one thing led to another, and he started talking about, like, Texas and all these things, and growing up, I always knew I wanted to end up in the South, like, the idea of Texas to me was like, oh, dude, that's where the people are, like, it's Texas, I want to go there, and um, when he said he lived in Texas, Fort Worth, he went to Texas Christian University, studied business, all these different things, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, and up to this point, I had never given any thought to like what college I wanted to go to, what I wanted to do. And uh, so that was like the first window I had looking into colleges and what they offered. Uh, I think I was like 14 at the time. And he said, oh, you know what? You're like, you're, you're a bright young individual. If you want to come visit, you know, you should come down and I'll take you to a baseball game and show you around. So months later, I did that. Uh, my mom and I flew down and went to a baseball game and he showed me around and um, yeah, just fell in love with the TCU campus. It's beautiful place it's just like it was a it was a perfect fit for me because I'd grown up in such a small town but TCU is like that small school with a big school feel and uh and just everything kind of aligned and that's the only school I wanted to go to the only school I toured and uh, the only school that I applied to so wow. yeah it seems like you just kind of have this conviction or something speaks to you can you elaborate has that always been the case and and does that continue in entrepreneurship <laughs> For better or for worse, yeah. It's kind of, um, once I've made my mind up about something, I'm going to do it. And it's it's just, uh, it may be like the spiritual side of me where it's like, this happened for a reason, so like don't ignore it or don't don't neglect it. But um, a lot of times if I have an idea or if 
some thought pops into my head and then I can back it up with some logic. I'm like, okay, yeah, TCU, good school, entrepreneurial program, Texas, like checks all the boxes. Like that's it. And to me, there's, there's no reason to waste time exploring other options. Just like, let's just do it. But uh, yeah, it's kind of held true in my life. I find something and I, I stick to it pretty, uh, pretty tightly. Seems to have worked out. We'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, I have uh, some quick hitter questions just so the audience can uh, get to know you better. Okay. Uh, no pressure. No wrong <laughs> answers, kind of. Um, all right. Having been in Dallas for a while, you know, pre-college, post-college, what's one thing you absolutely love about the city? The one thing I love about Dallas, besides how nice it is to have somewhere to park, because, you know, I've lived in Philadelphia and there's nowhere to park. Um, I love the, the, the culture here, like the food options and just like being able to go out and find places where you can hang out and do things because there's, there's some cities that are just too much of a city where it's like, everything's built very closely. It's very, it's cramped. And I feel like the planning they went behind Dallas, people actually thought through the city development. It's like, okay, like there's a park here. That's a good idea. Like, okay, like these buildings are not overcasting the other buildings. So, uh, I just like the way that Dallas was developed as a whole. I think it was it was built very well. It's like it's a weird answer, but I I just like that about Dallas. I totally agree, and it's like the twenty minute city before people thought of it. Yeah, you know, and they say how you can get everywhere in twenty minutes, mm-hmm. and and each little neighborhood you have everything you need, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a great place to be. Yeah, it's also it's it's weird the twenty minute city. It's like my my family lives out in Rockwall, which is only realistic like a half an hour drive but it feels like they're really far like you know they're far from me but it's just crazy how far yet close you are in this whole dfw metroplex interstates are great yeah absolutely (laughs) sometimes and then uh reflecting on your you know your early years in the education uh is there any particular aspect that seems to foreshadow or you know provide insight into your current interests yeah i mean tcu had just one hell of an entrepreneurial program. Um, I actually, I don't know if we're going to talk about this later, but I went to TCU and left and came back specifically for the program they introduced, which was entrepreneurship and innovation. So um, the old program had been entrepreneurial management, which was like a business degree with some subcategorical entrepreneurial focus. And um, when they introduced this new program, it was just, it was focused on, not so much how to do, but how to think. And a lot of the curriculum that we had was, is this a good idea? First off, how to come up with ideas, like how to, how to recognize a gap in the world and then come up with an idea to fix it and then take that idea and break it down 20 different ways and say like, is this viable? Is this feasible? Is this desirable? Um, but that part of the curriculum is what really helped me and what I do now because it didn't so much teach me, like I said, what to do or do in the business world, but really just how to think about it. And I think that was just a skill that is, you can't put a price on it. Yeah. Be adaptable in any situation yeah. with when you can think through mm-hmm. problem solutions or yeah. ideas. Mm-hmm. Super valuable. Another quick hitter is a uh, morning person or night owl. And what's your secret to starting your day or winding down? Uh, so I've been both. I've worked in nightclubs for a long time and I've when I wasn't working nightclubs, I was like up 6 a.m. You know, I did a, I did the whole ROTC thing at TCU for a while and did the early morning running. I prefer being a night owl just because, like, that's how my day's lined up. And to me, it's just more comfortable. However, if you want to function with the other members of society these days, you kind of have to get up early and go out and do all those things. But um, getting up early for me and kind of the routine that I follow is I typically wake up, chug a bunch of water, and especially now because I'm on this, like, 75 hard program. So I wake up. I want to get a lot of my water out of the way, start making breakfast, pretty consistent on my breakfast. I do uh, (laughs) – this is my my recipe here. Three eggs, three slices of turkey bacon, two butter tortillas from the Central Market – if you have not had buttered tortillas from the Central Market, you've got to get them. They'll change your life. But uh, that's my breakfast, and then I'll do some, like, random fruit juice. Like, right now I'm on, like, a passion fruit cold-pressed juice binge. So, like, a little shot of that, and then onto the coffee bar where I'm doing either, like, a cold brew or um, 
I like my cold brew like black, so I'm always trying different brands to see who's making the best cold brew. Or uh, I'll bust out the old espresso machine and whip up something that takes a little bit more time. But, uh, yeah, typically food, coffee, and then I go straight into working and just work until I have to go to the gym. So that's how I wake up. Winding down is typically, like, a lot of my partners are based around the globe, whether they're in Ireland or uh, Madrid or wherever, and a lot of the work we do is at odd times. So sometimes, like, I'll have a 7 o'clock at night meeting that lasts till 9 o'clock, and then it's like, okay, now it's time to wind down. But uh, typically just grab a book, maybe do some musical things, and then uh, just hit the hay. Get ready for that delicious breakfast. You're making me hungry when you were uh, hey, mentioning that. I'm telling you, it doesn't miss. Absolutely. I'll have to take a look at that. And then uh, in the realm of productivity, any quirky habits or rituals? Or I mean, it seemed pretty normal, nothing nothing too fancy. Just get up, get after it, get some, get some energy, some food, and, and you're ready to go. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, you know, I, I follow a lot of like the Andrew Huberman protocols. I just, I love his podcast. A lot of what he says I try to do in my life just because I know he's put thought into it, and I haven't. So <laughs> might as well just take his, his word for it. But, uh, you know, like sunlight, as, as quickly as I can, just it just wakes me up. And sometimes I'll even position my blinds in a way that the sun peers in when it rises just to make it easier to get out of bed. But um, nothing like too weird, just pretty typical, straightforward, <laughs> pretty vanilla mm-hmm. process here. That's pretty strategic with the blind placement. I like that. I'll have yeah. to add that one in. Yeah, I try to do it. You got to get it just right, though, because living at like an apartment complex or some kind of um, like – place where there's other people living there's always a lot of lights so you have to find that balance of like what can I let in right now at night versus what do I want to get in in the morning so it's uh it's like a fine line of pulling those cords you got to get them just right yes that or if you wake up too early then you're not going to get any light so yeah you have to figure that out a different way mm-hmm. and then you mentioned you know reading at night so what's what's a book that has had the most significant impact on your life or way of thinking book other than like the Bible would definitely be uh, The Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. It's like just a book that I have. I, it was gifted to me by one of my mentors that has since passed, and I have, I've read it probably 20 times. It's, it's a book that he used to give out to all the entrepreneurs in his life, and it's now a book that I give out to all the people in my life that want to do big things or want to perform. But um, the book itself is just, it's a wonderful book. It's about a guy who basically wants to end it all. He's kind of been in a rough business situation. He's ready to go. And he gets taken back through past. And he meets an influential leader like King Solomon or like Anne Frank, uh, Harry Truman. And each leader has an important message for him. And uh, the messages that are given to him are messages that have stuck with me in my life and the main idea around the messages that I've embodied, it's it's just perspective. Perspective is a lot of things. And that book does an incredible job of giving you the knowledge to kind of think about perspective and and treat it as it should be treated. Perspective. Perspective, man. That's huge. And then going back and continuously reading it and making sure it's top of mind is super impactful. Yeah. I've probably read that book, uh, two times a year ever since I was like 17. So I mean, it just sits on my shelf. I've got a lot of books on my shelf, and that's one that kind of sits out a bit, and I just pull it and read. I don't read all the old, the, the beginning part where you're leading up to the story because I've read it so many times, but when I get into the actual lessons, I'll go back and read them, and it's just it's just one of those books that I, I feel is applicable to any part of my life. I could pull it out and read one rule, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and then the different stage that you're in in life, you know, mm-hmm. some things can hit differently or you think about something differently yeah. and, uh, yeah, always looking, looking for that. Yeah. He's, de- he's definitely my favorite author. He's got a, he's got a lot of books out there, but they're all, he's one of those auth- authors where when he writes a book, stores have a hard time putting it either in like self help or fiction or business development. But a lot of his stories have great messages behind them. It's just the traveler's gift is my favorite, but I've read all of his, all of his pieces and I highly recommend reading all of them. Good stuff. All right. Well now we'll kind of uh, switch into, you know, you being a co-founder and of, you know, multiple businesses and brands. So first off with, um, you know, Dre horse, you know, how did that business opportunity come about? 
Yeah, everything started from Helmsman Imports back in 2020, I think 2020. And we just began to develop an ecosystem within the alcohol world, uh, really pioneered by my partners, Nate and Jeff. They started this company to really fill a lot of needs that small brands have. And uh, Helmsman Imports is a whole different discussion. But Dre Horse, that I'm a co-founder of now, the idea came in 2021. We had an opportunity to go out and build a manufacturing facility for beverages, contract manufacturing facility. And that idea came from our trials and tribulations of trying to find a co-packer when we created Drifter Can Cocktails. Um, really traveled all across the U.S. and went to these facilities and you know, some facilities had things that we liked, some had things that we didn't like, and some were just too big or some were too small. And it was just like finding that perfect facility that can do all the products, have the lowest minimum order quantity to get your brand in the door. Uh, it, was, it was almost impossible to find. We ended up finding one in um, California, like Northern California, the name will come to me, and then uh, like Philadelphia, kind of like Northern Philadelphia. But... It was just so hard to find, and the opportunity came where we could do it. So we got the funding. We began building the project back in 2022, the uh, the, the January 2022, really going out to the facility, uh, laying out all the diagrams and the MEP, and just a lot of planning, and the project is still ongoing right now. Just a lot of issues with, like, delays in construction and cost overages that are just really common with what we're doing. But we, we've been in that project for a while, and given the situation we were in with kind of um, a landlord issue with wanting to build a part of our facility, we knew that we needed to get nimble and find some other ways to bring in some revenue. So we pivoted the business a bit and began focusing more on product development f- to make bring products to market and uh, consulting work. So that is what we've been doing for the last year and a half, and that's kind of where client list comes into play but uh yeah that's that's dre horse just a contract manufacturing facility you know we were, we were the brand guys who wanted to create a, a place for brands and uh, we wanted to basically create the beverage makers paradise where it's like oh i want to throw nitro in a drink sure like i want to pasteurize it sure you know and uh yeah, that that was it's been a lot of fun it's been a blast and we're really excited to open up this year and your partners are are a little bit uh senior than you yeah, both my partners are uh, a little older than me. Um, I'm significantly younger than them, and I think it works well that way. You know, they know, I mean, they're both way smarter than me. Um, both Nate and Jeff have skills that I may never, <laughs> never obtain, but I bring a, a little bit of youth to the table, and, you know, it, it's, it's a good, really good balance of them and myself. And then how did you get connected to them? And then, you know, how did you work your way in? And what, what did they see in you that said, all right, this is a guy we want to find, you know, start companies with? Yeah, sure. We, uh, when I was a junior in college, going into my senior year, I was bouncing at one of the nightclubs in Fort Worth. So one of my professors had known that. He also runs the entrepreneurial department at TCU, and he always – was wanting to introduce this new program called the Entrepreneurial Intern Scholars Program. It sounds really complex. It's basically just you get an internship with a startup and you get some college credit for it. And Nate, my partner now, came to him and said, hey, like I love a a young intern that I could throw into this importing company, just, you know, help help with some of the back-end work. And um, so Rodney started this project. He knew he had enough startups within the Fort Worth community to really bring students into it and he knew that I was working in the alcohol world in a sense because I had bartended down in College Station and came up and bounced here so he was like you know it's a good fit alcohol guys alcohol guys and uh, so I started working with Nate Uh, we, we would meet like once a week he would teach me different things and looking back at the time some of the things he was teaching me were just so high level and because he's just so smart that a lot of what I was doing is just playing catch up, trying to understand. And, you know, I'm 20, 21 at the time trying to figure out like, what is this guy talking about? I didn't even know what Helmsman Imports was until my internship was over. Like that, that's how difficult the business model was to understand. But Nate introduced me to his partner, Jeff, because they also owned a craft liquor portfolio together called Drifter Spirits. And 
they were releasing a canned cocktail. So this was like coming off the wave of COVID. I mean, still COVID, but, you know, we were wearing masks and whatnot. Well, in Texas, we didn't never really wore masks, but coming off that wave. And during that wave, their company, Drifter Spirits, decided to start a canned cocktail side of their business. And that was mainly because they couldn't get on premise. They couldn't get into bars to sell their spirits. And a lot of their spirits are very high end. They, they belong in cocktails. So, you know, they're not going to do well on the retail front. So what they did was they said, hey, you know, we're, we're stuck here. We can't do anything about it. Let's just take our spirits and put them into cans, make them into cocktails, use our distribution network, and get them out there. So they brought me into that, uh, just helping with the operations in that Petaluma, California. That's what it was. There it is. So they brought me out to Petaluma. I started working with Jeff. Jeff was the operations guy. And Jeff really took me underneath his wing, taught me everything that I know, um, really just acted as his shadow for years. And, and times I still am just his shadow, <laughs> you know, he's always teaching me. But uh, so they kind of double dipped me from Helmsman Imports to Drifter because it was all owned by the same people. And um, we decided just to continue my internship per se. And I kind of became a contractor. So I continued to work for Helmsman, really helped transform that company out of, we were just operating out of like Gmail, Google Sheets, moving products all across the world. And we're still operating out of like Google Sheets. And uh, we, we ended up getting a system built. And that's kind of where my my roles ended there. I was just, there was nothing else that I could really do uh, from that that job title. And during all that is when they had the opportunity to do Dre Horse, and they just said, you know, we've got Jans, and we don't really have anything for him to do right here in this importing company because we'd set it up in a way where you really did, you just needed entry level people to come in and just fulfill orders or whatnot. And now those people that started with us at the entry level have blossomed into just really awesome employees, and they own their part of the business, and we don't even want to touch it. They've become experts at it, and that that's just who they are. But the opportunity came for Dre Horse. And Jeff calls me up. I was actually driving on I-30 coming back to Rockwall. He's like, hey, I want to build a canning facility. Remember what we did for Drifter Can Cocktails? Like, let's start one of those. And in my mind, I'm like, let's go. At first, he was like, we're going to put it in New Jersey. I'm like, okay, I don't know anything about New Jersey other than, like, Uncle Joey Diaz lives there. So I'm like, okay, kind of cool. And, um, you know, we searched New York, New Jersey, and we ended up on Philadelphia, you know, looking back, maybe we should have gone to New York. We like, we just, they live in New York. They love New York. I love New York. But we ended up doing Philly and they just decided to bring me on as a partner because we like, we just like working together. We all kind of complimented each other in the right ways. That's great. And I think mentorship is huge, especially at a young age to get mm -hmm. that and, and learn and absorb. I mean, just drinking from the fire hose is huge, yeah. hugely important. And, uh, and the growth and the, the knowledge that you get from them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, uh, that's been the biggest part of it all is just Jeff and Nate have taught, just given me knowledge. And, you know, even when I haven't asked for it, that's just like they're giving it to me. And, and it's been the best thing for me because I could have paid more money to go get another degree to learn it. But Jeff and Nate just handed me the knowledge. And, uh, you know, I, I will forever be thankful for that. And it's a really good relationship where we're partners, we're friends. But on top of that, you know, they're teachers to me and mentors to me. So got lucky. Takes a little bit of that, right? Yep. A little bit of luck. Absolutely. On the job training, personal MBA. <laughs> well, now let's, uh, let's go, uh, you know, I know you've you touched on it, what Dre Horse does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so let's dive a little bit deeper into that. And so, you know, the problem that they're, they're solving, and obviously it seems like your partners were kind of, you know, quote unquote, the first clients or customers and they kind of built this because they saw a need in the market based upon their own experience mm -hmm. being beverage entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a huge supply and demand mismatch to begin with, with uh, the canning facilities, especially with the COVID situation. Everybody wanted to do what we did, which was introduce an RTD format of their, whatever they had. And at the time we, everyone was thinking the same thing, like, who are we going to use? You know, we have a product that needs a specific thing done to it. And the only guy that does it in America, I have to do 500,000 cases to get in the door. And that was the first, like, okay, we should do this. There's a supply and demand mismatch there. For the audience, RTD? Yeah, RTD, ready to drink. Ready to uh, drink. Also known as like canned cocktail, beer, canned coffee. RTD is just jargon in the, be <laughs> the beverage world. 
and it's super popular as many people know mm-hmm. celebrities are getting into it leveraging their personal brand yeah can yeah. you talk a little bit about that and kind of the client base and and who's approached you guys and how yeah uh we have been approached by a lot of people wanting to do something within the liquor world whether it be an rtd with their personal brand leveraging that to really push sales or uh, starting a whole liquor brand and just utilizing like consulting services and product development. But some of the, uh, the cool guys that first came to us, it was sweet chick, which is a gourmet chicken and waffles place up in New York. And I think they have a location out in maybe LA somewhere Southern California, but they came to us and they were already serving bottled cocktails, like out of a plastic bottle. They just made them in the back, gave them with maybe a, a meal of chicken and waffles. And they're all about brand. They are a celebrity hot spot. I mean, it is, if you ever go to New York, you've, you've got to visit it. it is, it's an awesome place. But a lot of visionaries in that company, and when they came to us, they said, you know, I think there's an opportunity here to create a canned cocktail. And we formulated it, created it, a lot of crazy stories with it from the operational end that I could get into. But, yeah, we did that, and that was like the first restaurant group, you know, in the – United States, we have the three-tier distribution system, which doesn't allow retailers to really own their own brands. So we have a way that we illegally bring them their product. And because of that, it's opened the door to a lot of potential, you know, partnerships of restaurant groups, hospitality groups. Uh, Run the Jewels is a, it's like a hip hop group out of New York. They came to us and said, you know, hey, you know, we don't really want the whole nine yards, but could you just make us a product and we're going to take it. So uh, developed that product, gave it to them, and they're doing well. They take it on tour with them. So, you know, in, in our decks and in our investment decks and pitch decks, we always say like Dre Horse on tour with Run the Jewels, and it's 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 a cool thing to say. But yeah, those are like celebrities. We've had some other celebrities that have come to us, but um, didn't pan out. We had a conversation with T Pain's group, uh, not T Pain himself. I wish, but. There was an opportunity there that didn't end up happening, but he had just written the book, Can I Mix You a Drink, with a famous bartender, Maxwell Britton, who's a part of our ecosystem. And they came to us and just like, hey, hey, what would it cost to do this? And we just kind of gave him the rundown, and it never came to light. But uh, maybe one day. Maybe we'll get a T-Pain cocktail one day. But, yes, as far as celebrities go, they're just they're in alcohol right now. That's the big thing. <laughs> it is. And there's lots of money to be made, which is probably it why is. They're, they're headed there. Yeah, that, and that was the big the big thing with Sweet Chick. It was like, look, you can take your whiskey peach tea in store, and here's your margin. Or we can formulate it, and here's your margin. And uh, when you see the numbers, it's it's a no-brainer. So You uh, spoke to me about a story about investors and, and showing off a property um, in, in, a, in, the, in a better light, you know, and uh, making sure that it's done and and – even though, uh, yeah, it was a horrible entry to it, but talk to me a little bit about the story about, you know, making sure that the investors were happy and you had to uh, quickly improvise with um, a project and, and yeah. Yeah, so we had this facility in Philadelphia. It's a it's an old historical building. So the construction on it, I mean, you're in this world, you know construction as well as anybody, but building on a historical site or within a historical building is quite difficult because you have to get approval essentially at every step where it's like, Hey, can we tear down this wall? Like, no, you can't do that. That was built in the 1800s. Don't touch that. So uh, construction was delayed quite a bit coming into it all through 2022, but we finally got the concrete floors laid, which was like a huge milestone because we never thought it was going to happen. And we ended up getting the facility basically ready with a floor, a roof, all of our walls, all of our doors. And our investor basically took that as we were open, like he he wants to come and see it. So we're not going to tell him, no, it's not open. So Jeff calls me. He's like, we need to get everything in there. And at the time we probably had like a month to do it, but some of our equipment was in hard to reach places. And uh, so within a matter of like two weeks, I had called all of our vendors I said, hey, schedule this truck to show up at our facility, and uh, we're going to move in all the, the machines. Well, my, my buddy Wes and I, we ended up renting a telehandler, which is like an outdoor forklift with that boom arm that extends. And what we were going to do, because we didn't have loading docks yet, so what we had was this like 
a big hole in the wall that was built over with wood, and then it had these two wooden like garage doors that would swing open, and then you could shut them and lock them with like a master lock. But it was huge. I mean, it was like a 10-foot-10 10 10 opening. So what we were going to do was open that up, and we're going to put all the machines, just like slide them in through there. And then we bought a pallet. Like, I showed up to Harbor Freight that morning. I went and bought a pallet jack, somehow fit it into my car. Everyone is, like, laughing at us. Like, you're not going to get it in there. We got it in there. Uh, brought the pallet jack to the facility. And the idea was, okay, we'll get everything in there, drop it down, and then use the pallet jack and drag it to its respective place. And then the engineer for the actual canning company will be there and he'll put everything together. Like, we're just going to move like a fluid machine. Well, all the trucks show up and everything is just like 10 times bigger than I had imagined, which I knew the specs. I had the dimensions. I made the plans. I'm like, okay. But when you see it in person, it's like, wow, because everything is crated. So what you think is a five foot five machine is actually like a 10 foot 10 machine because it's protected. So what we did was Wes and I, we were like, okay, we got to figure out how to drive this telehandler. We're not licensed. And I hope this doesn't get out, but we, uh, we watched a YouTube video, figured it out. You're like, dude, all of our buddies back at home, we're from the Midwest. Everybody can drive these things. So we're fine. So we, uh, just hopped in and started unloading all this equipment, you know, driving it up a hill, getting it up there, sliding it in. And, uh, yeah, we, we ended up getting it all in, got it all set up. The engineer from the canning company was just amazed. He's like, I've never seen anybody do this. You, you guys, you kids are clearly just like psychopaths. We're like, hey, we just got to get it done. And then we had to get actually a, a real forklift for the indoor portion. I don't think I, I might have showed you this part, but we had to get a forklift for the indoor portion because what we needed to do was um, stand up this thing called a, a D-PAL. And what the D-PAL does is it takes your pallet of cans, like an elevator, takes it all the way up and pushes the cans off so that they fall down into the whole assembly line, as, as you can call it. But what we had to do was use a forklift to actually tip the machine up. Well, we're like, how are we going to get a forklift in this building? So we rented a forklift, and just Wes and I said, hey, we're going to figure it out. And Wes is my dog. He, he problem-solving to the max during these couple weeks, and was just I couldn't have done it without him. But we got the forklift, and mind you, we don't have a loading dock. We don't have a parking lot. It's just like a mud hill. It wasn't mud at the time, but before they delivered it, it starts pouring down rain. And there's indoor tires on this forklift. So we're like, oh, here we go. We're going to try to get it up here. So, you know, we hop in the forklift. We drive maybe an inch, and we are sunk in the mud. So what we did was we went and contacted some local people that I knew, and they came out, and we basically got a crew of like four or five dudes. And for almost three hours, we problem solved on getting this forklift up this hill, up into the facility. And what we ended up doing was we used some truck mud flaps, like big old mud flaps, like, I don't know, five feet long. We would place it in front of the forklift, and then we would use a backhoe that my buddy was in. We would chain the forklift to the backhoe, pull it, pull it onto the mud flap, and then get another mud flap. And we basically did this, like, domino thing one after another until we got it up to the door. And then we realized once we got to the door – we didn't have a way to get it up, so we went and built a ramp out of one of the crates that was there for the machine, built this ramp, and then we got the forklift. to the. We were going to launch it up this ramp into the facility, and lo and behold, we got it done. And Yeah, and then, of course, they ended up building the wall afterwards, so the forklift was stuck in there. We had to pay extra storage fees, but it was an awesome time, you know, awesome story. <laughs> That video of you with your hands up celebrating once it, it didn't break the crate to get into yeah. the to the hole there yeah. in the facility was hilarious. It, it was a great feel. I mean, at first thought, it was like, we're never going to get this. And then it was like, we have to get this. There's no option. We're getting it in there, like, one way or another. And, uh, yeah, when we finally just, like, there, it hit a thresh. What we thought was going to happen, it was going to snap through the ramp. So we had built up bricks underneath the ramp to support the weight because i mean forklifts are thousands of pounds and we ended up getting it like over the hump that we thought and it was just like everything just washed through you're like okay we did it but it was it was a long day 
I I love that story because it just it just shows your character and you know your commitment to your boss saying you know the best is coming I'll get it done I'll figure it out and you just took it in your own hands with your help of Wes and some other buddies and just you know were determined to to get it done and you did. Yeah, I mean that that's, that that's been my my title in these companies is just just get it done. You know, I, I always tell people you know you're either the person who gets shit done or you're the person who asks the person that gets shit done to get shit done. So just, just get it done. And, uh, that's just what we did in entrepreneurship and startup world. There's not many people ask. So no. you got to look at yourself and, and look in a mirror and, and get on with it. Now let's, uh, let's ask some a little more entertaining questions to do. Can you share a, a challenge you faced in your professional journey that taught you a valuable lesson? Yeah, I mean, moving out to Philadelphia was, that was the challenge. You know, I was leaving my family, my girlfriend at the time, and it was probably the hardest thing that I had done in my life because I'm moving across the country all by myself. Uh, Even my my partners didn't even move to Philadelphia at the time. It was just me out there trying to figure things out and managing the business and the build as well as having no friends out there and trying to manage my girlfriend in Texas at the time. It was really hard because, you know, you always feel like you're letting somebody down. It's like if I'm talking to her, I'm not focused on this. Or if I'm focused on this, I'm neglecting her. And it's not fair to her because I'm only 1,200 miles away. And, you know, when you have that kind of long-distance relationship, it's like you only get to see each other every 12 weeks for like a weekend. So, I mean, it was really hard on her. But moving out there, it just reinforced this idea of, like, delayed gratification. It's And that that was the biggest lesson from it all, like, Moved out there, knew it was going to suck. It did suck. I moved back to Dallas in probably May of 2023. And, um, yeah, you know, delayed gratification. Just knowing I was out there for a reason. You know, there's a good project came out of it. And, um, yeah, that, that's probably my best answer for that. Well, that makes sense. It's nice to know that you have a, a end goal or there's a, there's a deadline yeah. or there's, you know, something around the corner. So mm-hmm. you're, not, you're not there forever. Um, all right. I got a bunch of these. So what's a must have app or tool that has significantly improved your personal life? I use a, this dieting app called carbon. I think it's called carbon diet. It's kind of like my fitness pal, but the UI on this app is so much better. Uh, just keeping my, my diet in check, you know, always scanning my food, making sure I'm hitting my macros, not exceeding. And, you know, when I can stay true to my diet, it's typically with the help of this app. So that's the one app that I, I know that I open on the daily. I like that one. Haven't heard of that one. Can you uh, share a personal productivity hack or time-saving tactic that you swear by? I mean, productivity to me is a lot about just organization. You know, you can't know what – you're not going to work on anything if you don't know what to work on. So before you kind of hit the ground running, working – knowing what you want to work on and having things lined out, you know, between my partners and I, we have a lot of entities that they're all very similar. You know, they're beverages, they're all related with the alcohol world. So I like to have this little dashboard that I have on my desk where it's got all the different entities and all the things I need to get done between the entities. And before I get to working, I sit down and I think, okay, this has to get done. I've got to call this person. I've got to check in. And then once I actually open up the computer and get going, I just check them off, go down the list. And so, yeah, organization is probably the biggest productivity tip that I can give. But I don't have any, like, weird, (laughs) you know, do this instead of that. Planning is key. That way know where you're going. Mm -hmm. When dealing with a challenging day or seems like, you know, a nice fire drill, what's your go-to strategy or, or mantra that helps you stay positive or navigate through, you know, those difficulties? There's a lot of firefights that pop up. I think winning that battle has to be won years prior to that battle. I think, you know, you just got to understand that a lot of things are going to pop up in life and how you react is going to determine everything. You know, in the operations world, things can get destroyed. People can fire. People can do terrible things. And it's just like, do I want to sit here and cry about it or do I just need to just do it and not have an emotional attachment to it. So for me, I don't really have any bad days. Just, I just do things and it is what it is. But for the couple of times that I'm having a really str- a hard day and I'm struggling, I'll just give my mom a call because we're super tight. And I'll be like, mom, you wouldn't believe this. And then we'll just go in and, you know, she'll be like, all right, she'll talk me off the edge. She's like, you're fine. You'll be okay. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm just being a baby. So 
that's probably the only thing that I do when I'm maybe really stressed or have a lot of things on my plate. Yeah, that's great. And mindset is key. I mean, like you're saying, just all goes through that filter and, and bettering your mindset and staying strong to that will help you with whatever is mm -hmm. uh, going on in the world and in your life there. Fun one? Fun one. Your task is to come up with a creative and absurd tactic or strategy you would employ in this situation. Okay. Your canning and bottling facility has the opportunity to collaborate with a renowned artist who wants to turn your beverage packaging into collectible art pieces. Each can or bottle becomes a canvas for a unique artwork. How do you integrate these artistic designs into your production process while maintaining the integrity of the beverages inside? That's a very layered question because typically what happens when you do a beverage, is the client will come to you with the artwork and then you pass it off to your can vendor. So you're saying if every can had to be different, honestly, it wouldn't fall on my plate. It would actually fall on the can vendor, so I would feel bad. But, um, you know, the beverage is always going to be the same. If, if, let's say, somebody wanted to do, like, they did a run where they wanted to just do like a crazy, it's something that's never been done before. You know, there's a lot of ways you could do it mechanically, you know, shutting off pumps, plugging new pumps in, cleaning the machine, giving it a quick reset, purging the machine. But, um, you know, as far as like hypothetically, if every can could be different and they would make, it would be a struggle on the team. I would just tell the team like, look, this is an opportunity to do something really cool. No one's done it before. Here's how it's going to be. It's going to be tough. We're going to have to tough. We're going to have to manhandle every product. You know, everything's going to have to be done by hand. And it may take us three days to do, but you're just, we're just going to do it because you only get one chance to do something important in life. And um, especially with the values of what Dre Horse is, is it's hardworking integrity. Like we're the one that we, we pull the boat, we pull the ship. And uh, so it's really just, that, that's how I would do it. You know, have a conversation with the people that are doing it on the ground and say, hey, we've just got to do it. But, uh, yeah, I mean. Man, I just got to stop and say that was an inspirational speech. I'd want you in that halftime <laughs> locker room. You guys, you get the, guy, the guys going, inspiring right there. The team will, will break through a wall on that one. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Maybe the Cowboys needed that one <laughs> last week. Too soon, I think. <laughs> um, all right, time to predict the future. So envision yourself as a fortune teller predicting the future of your industry or business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the beverage industry, it it's uh, like like all industries and all things in life, it probably works on a pendulum where people are going to push the boundaries as far as they can as, until it doesn't make sense, until like they're probably selling empty cans of air. Like like liquid death is out there, you know, like where they're selling canned water. If you told somebody that 10 years ago, like, hey, the biggest brand on the market is going to be water in a can, and we're going to call it liquid death, people would look at you like you're crazy. So I think the beverage world will continue to innovate and just push that boundary. There's going to be flavor innovations, but that's probably not going to be the key. I think there's, you know, new brand collaborations, like, can we sell a t-shirt with this can? Or, you know, What's the new can format? I, I think format is probably going to be the biggest thing. You know, what can we put a beverage into? What pouch? What cardboard box? It's going to do that until it busts, until you, you walk into a store and you're like, what are these? You know, you've got, you've got a, like, I have a pouch of passion fruit juice in my house. It's literally like, it looks like a, a purse. And I, th I think the formats will continue to change until everyone just gets tired of it or, What's going to happen is a brand's going to come up with a really cool packaging concept. They're going to have one vendor that can do it. They're going to get popular. That vendor's not going to be able to keep up because when you introduce new packaging formats, you've got to have a facility to make them. And that's a whole nother business. So you're relying on somebody to run that business too. So if that packaging company can't get the raw materials they need or the labor, or they're going to fail and then your brand's going to run a product then that pendulum is going to swing right back and we're back to glass and bottle Coca-Cola. <laughs> so back to the classics, back to the classics. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think just the boundaries are going to be pushed in that format realm. Yeah. It's almost a marketing play I mean, yep. for a little bit, at least. Mm -hmm. I think so. Embrace your inner superhero. Imagine yourself as a superhero with unique powers related to your entrepreneurial skills. Describe your superhero persona and powers. Related to my entrepreneurial 
world. Uh, something to do with time where I could pause time and just work. Um, time and teleportation because the one thing that I don't like about my situation with my partners and our businesses is that I don't ever get to be with them physically. And I think that that is a key part of, you know, forming relationships is physically being with the person and seeing how their body language is, how they interact with others. And I wish I could spend more time with my founders, but everybody's out doing their thing and every, it's just how it has to be. So I wish if I had a superpower, I could teleport and probably slow down time so that I could plan better, have more time in the day to work, have more time in the day to have better relationships with people. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs probably have those too. Yeah, that would be pretty neat. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool. Yeah, play some pickleball. Play some pickleball. Pause we'll get time. out there. Get out there. Hey, if we can teleport, we can play both sides of the court. Just hit it back and forth. That'd be dangerous. That'd be dangerous. I would hate myself. <laughs> All right. And then the last one here. Give an elevator pitch for one of these three products. Okay. Get creative. Okay. Elevator pitch. Keep it keep, keep it quick. All right. Okay. The sock saver clip. You know, you always lose socks in the laundry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you don't. I do. A lot of people do. Think. <laughs> okay. The sneeze guard 3000. Or the instant sunshine generator. Instant sunshine generator. Yeah, pick one and elevator pitch, get creative. Oh, those are all such good ideas, man. And I, it's crazy because I lose my socks all the time. Um, I mean, my pitch, I would do it for the sock one. And I, first off, I would come to the pitch, and I'll give the pitch, but I would come to the pitch with actual data on, like, how much money you spend a year buying new socks because you're losing them in couches or, you know, whatever. I thought you were going to say you were going to come to the pitch with one sock on. Well, I, I, could, you're going well with that. I could do that too, but I would show the data and show like, this is what you're spending per year. And then, All right. Where's the pitch? Here we go. I'm, I'm your investor. All right. Shark so tank for Garrett. So let's say that we have, let's have a whiteboard here and the whiteboard, it's got $50,000 on it. It's red. It's blinking minus, you know, Hi, Sharks. Are you tired of spending $50,000 a year losing all the valuable assets in your home? And then they're going to be like, oh, what's this guy talking about? Drop the thing. Socks. And then I go on to say, did you know that the average American loses 47 socks per month? Do the math. You know how many pairs that is? It's a lot. Bring out the product. Give it to Mark. Give it to Mr. Wonderful introducing the sock saver. And then I'd need to come up with like a cool little slogan, like the best feature of your day. I don't know. Something to do with feet, you know, the wordplay, the sock, the sock, what is it? The sock saver clip. Exactly. The sock saver clip. I'm how much do I need to write? That was brilliant. That, that's my thought. I'm sold. It needs to be sat down and written, written out and thought through, but that's how I do it. That's wonderful, <laughs> man. Very creative on the toes. That's great. A couple stories in there. Um, and then we have we have a few minutes left, and so sure. I know you and I connected on um, obviously a couple a couple weeks ago at that entrepreneurial event, and I mentioned about the social club that I'm starting, yeah. and so I guess you know in in your opinion, you know what excites you most about a social club um, that's for high performers, that's you know experience based, where it's not just uh, you know open networking it's you know purposeful socialization yeah. where it's you know social activities or personal development workshops what what excites you about that i think the most exciting part about that is the intention of meeting uh you know like you said something other than networking or a social hour there's a time and place a lot of times we'll meet as entrepreneurs as like a networking event and say i'm i'm so and so i do this i can help you this way and vice versa and a lot of meaningful connections are made through that but I think if the intent is to just say, hey, we're all entrepreneurs, we're all founders, we're all high performers, we just want to be social uh, and give somebody an outlet to go and hang and whatnot. I mean, the alternative, and this is, you know, I know you and I have talked about this, is like nowadays you're just kind of making friends with who's around you. And when you're doing things in life that are fun and important and other people around you are doing things that they either don't like and they're not doing exciting things in their own words, you know, they come and complain about it. It's almost like when you talk about yourself, it comes off as like bragging or it's like, dude, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you what I did today. And I think by creating a, a, a group or a format where the intent is like, we're all doing this. So like, let's just hang out. 
uh, it's very appealing to a lot of people that are probably in that entrepreneurial journey or in that position. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you hopping on, uh, you know, the vision, seeing the vision yeah. and coming on this podcast for my, my first guest here. Of course. So Jansen's been a pleasure. Excited to see what other beverages and, and brands you, you, uh, you run with and create. And uh, maybe next time we'll have a few in store for, for the guests so we can do a little, you know, taste testing. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do a live taste test here. I'll bring some into the studio. There we go. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. Absolutely.